microgrids, and then you get local governments building mini grids. Our biggest problem with power is transmission and distribution. If every state had its own mini distribution network, we won't have this power crisis because the power demands of states are not large. Generate your own power, distribute it within your own states. That would solve the crisis, but we're still dependent on this national grid, you know, which for me is a big, 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 big problem. Because when you generate power in Lagos or Meduguri or Sukutu or Aba, and it goes into a central grid, it gets too convoluted. All these things have to be domesticated and localized. So I fully agree with you, Pastor, about, you know, Nigeria being this unitary state. That is our biggest, biggest problem as, a, as an economy. And then lastly, I'll come to the issue of ease of doing business. A lot of companies have relocated, as we know, to countries like Ghana and now because, because of the convoluted way in which our leaders change their minds. They just change policy in a haphazard fashion. You know, they decide, hey, we want to increase tax today. We're going to increase it from 10% to 20% without any consultation, without any thinking about the impact it would have. And to be honest, all this happens simply because we as a people let it happen. I'm just hoping that the NSARS movement is a turning point in our history because for once our youth have stood up and said, you know what, we're not having this anymore. You people have ruined our past. You are now looking to ruin our futures. We're not going to have it. So um, fingers crossed, I'm hoping that going forward, the Nigerian people will say to present and future governments, you know what, you just can't do what you want without our consultation. We elected you into office to represent our views. So if you do what we don't like, we're not going to have it and we're going to take to the streets. So so can you give me a few suggestions Zaya, as to what practical steps we can take on this platform or what practical steps the average Nigerian can take to ensure that we get government as it is, the present or the future government to diversify the economy? Can we force them, for instance, to go back to 1958 and have only four items on the so-called exclusive list? Uh, I think it also included defense or something like that and yeah. foreign service or, well, not even foreign service. In fact, those regions, each region had its own foreign service at that time. Okay, so maybe it included defense uh, and uh, uh, police to some extent. The second uh, question I want you to tackle is, do you think all the 36 states are viable or should some states merge together? Or do we go back and try and have five regions and then you can then add on Benin and Togo and Niger and Cameroon as the eighth, eighth, eighth regions, okay? Uh, somebody said five regions, the Southwest, the South-South, the Southeast, the Middle Belt, and the Northern region. Or you could have six, Northeast, Northwest, or whatever it is. Then Cameroon, Niger, Togo, Dahomey. And if Ghana is not careful, we grab them. <laughs> <laughs> then you truly have Ghana must go. But anyway, what are your thoughts, my dear brother? I'm enjoying you. Uh, well, to be honest, I mean, your first question is, what can we do as a platform? Yes. Uh, I would like us to hold a seminar, to be honest, because we've debated this thing round and round and round over the years. We've had two national summits, and the approach of the government seems to be that all this talk about the structure is a political issue. I think we need to make it clear to them, no, it's not a political, it's an economic issue. Very good. Yeah. Unless, the, nobody has anything to fear from restructuring. Nobody. Unless Nigeria is restructured, our economy will not grow. That's simply the reality of where we stand. In terms of viability, I do not believe there's one state in Nigeria, one state in Nigeria, that does not have the potential to be an economic giant. I mean, I look at San Diego, for instance. San Diego used to be a barren desert with nothing. But guess what? They built it. It's now one of the, I think it's the world's largest gambling center in the world, you know, on the planet. They've turned it into an oasis. You just look at some of the deserts in Texas and Mexico. Some of them, some of these areas produce nothing but cactus. 
you know, but people have managed to turn cactus into an alcoholic beverage. They've got companies that are manufacturing this. You know, across the world, wherever you go, you see, man is a very, very innovative person. He's a very, very innovative being. And the beauty of Nigeria is that we're actually very, very creative people. You know, we don't just sit down and, and, and do nothing. Unfortunately, our potential has not been tapped in. So I think if we could hold a summit, if we could actually push the case before the government, we could make some headway. You see, in the UK here, every weekend or every fortnight, your MP has to hold a surgery where he meets his constituents. And we push our case before them. In Nigeria, we don't do that. This coming Saturday, we've got a demonstration, an NSAS demonstration in, in the London Borough of Greenwich. And our MP is going to be there because there's a large, I think Nigeria's we got something like 20% of the population. And we'll be, he's going to be one of our speakers. We'll be pushing our case before him. We want him to raise the issue of the lucky shooting in the House of Commons. He dare not say he's not doing it or we will be on his case. But in Nigeria, how many senators and members of the House of Representatives are fearful that if they don't do anything, their people will be on their case? So we condone it. So it's our fault. And then, uh, you know, on the issue of states merging, on the issue of states merging, you know, sometimes in the past I've written, I've taken, decided to take states one at a time and look at their potential. And sometimes when I look at some states, I just think, hey, what's going on here? I look at Niger State. Do you know Nigeria is the world's largest producer of shear nuts? Niger State is the major producer. If you had a, an edible nut processing plant industry in Nigeria, you could have plants in places like Bida, Mina, Kotangora. We could become the world's largest producer. And you can make edible nuts. You know, the plants can be modular, whereby you can shell shear nuts, coconuts, groundnuts, palm oil. You can do all them all within the same industry. Niger State could easily generate that 30 billion from edible nuts alone. I look at somewhere like Kogi, the Confluent State. If you dredged the rivers Niger and Benue, built hydroelectric powered plants on them, you know, you could have a fishing industry related to it. You look at somewhere like Bayelsa or Rivers, you could have a shipping industry. I mean, I look at somewhere like Kebi and Sokoto and Zamfara that get a lot of sunlight. Why are they not big, 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 huge solar farms? They could be manufacturing solar panels. They could be manufacturing electricity transformers. You could make them energy industry states, whereby power is their main thing. So I do not believe there's any state in Nigeria that is not viable. Nobody showed me any evidence to that effect. And um, in terms of merging with our neighbors, I think if they see the economic benefits, remember Texas once used to be part of Mexico but they saw the economic benefits of merging with the US. I think if we showed our neighbors good governance, they'll be a lot, lot keen to join us. You know, I'm sure all you need to do is have a referendum. And if people vote by an overwhelming majority to merge, I think we can proceed with it. I think these are very, very good thoughts. And I think we're going to encapsulate most of what you said into some kind of paper and find a way of either presenting it to the executive arm of the federal government or also to the various houses and see if somebody has the courage to move a bill in this direction. First of all, the restructuring as an economic issue and not a political issue and getting rid of this exclusive list uh, or reducing it considerably so that we can free up the economy and uh, go back to this 50, 20, 30, sharing formula that you've come up with and uh, we can then take it from there. I think that would be a very good start uh, to this whole thing. But you've spoke, spoken about answers, but I'm afraid to go in there because the way you've spoken about it, I may not be able to come out. I have a friend on the platform, Mr. Emeka Uju, Oguju, who also I think is a development economist and is asked to offer some thoughts on the diversifying of the economy. And then maybe I'll come back to your answers uh, issue and then we begin to take questions from the platform. So if you have any questions or suggestions or contributions on the platform, please begin to prepare them. I'll take Emeka's contribution, two minutes, then I'll come back to you, Ayo, and take any further thoughts 
that you have on diversifying the economy and what really we should be doing. I like the fact that you've told us all the various potentials that you think is possible in each of these states. I wish somebody really could give us an in-depth economic analysis of each of the states and bring about an economic viability report as to what each state should be focusing on. I mean, if I were governor of those states or even the president, I would, I would, I would, I would commit to such a report so that that can guide the, 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 the economic development of that state. I'm not even sure any state really has that kind of report. They, they all live by rule of thumb and uh, history. But Emeka, can I have your thoughts on diversifying the Nigerian economy very quickly? Please unmute yourself and introduce yourself. And then two minutes, please, so that we don't overrun. Yeah, thanks, uh, Aitua, for having me. Uh, my name is Emeka Ugoju, um, founder of uh, Nigerian Entrepreneurship Summit and Honors, which Aitua happens to be the in-house pastor. I think <laughs> I'll just go quickly. But well, you don't pay your tithes to your pastor, Emeka, but I forgive you. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I'll defy what the uh, speaker has been saying. Nesh decided uh, this year for the next five years that we will have to do something and not just talk about in regards to the diversification. But our focus is with the local governments or the local governments in the country. So what we've done is get all the local governments together. We're supposed to start off, maybe flag off the journey, October 27, but because of uh, what has happened, we moved it forward. Basically, this is how uh, it's going to work. Of course, most of the local government right now have to get authorization from their state governments. Okay, so we have the Nigerian Governors Forum coming into it, and the focus is on starting off with at least one industry per local government. Okay, based on what he's been talking about, where each local government has maybe the material, raw materials, or agro product that value can be added upon, build an ecosystem. Firo says they have some fabrication technology, which okay, they can bring to the table. Raw material research say they have an idea of what each local government has. Unido has some idea. So we bring all the ecosystem together and see how we also lobby for an equity fund that is sizable, domiciled under Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority that in terms of average, we say let's start with $2 million for the local government. But the point being that let's now stop talking. And if we say each local government have this, provide the ecosystem whereby we set a five-year target over the next five years. Every year we'll be reviewing how have we uh, been able to do something. And then uh, all the parties uh, involved will see how we move forward or how we not move forward. The point being, moving from the point of talking to the point of doing. Then from the ministry point of view, the Ministry of Industry is involved, science and uh, technology, and then finance will be involved with regards to the equity fund we are talking about. So what we're saying is what he actually was saying about, uh, we have certain things in different areas. Yeah, let us now start doing what do we have the people who know what we have, bring it to the table. Nesh will do their own in terms of uh, also being part of producing local entrepreneurs that can be able to uh, make use of this uh, matters. So Itwa, I think I invited you. So you follow it too. When we fix the new date, you'll be part of it. <laughs> very, very interesting. Do you have a time frame within which you want to drive this process and is NESH going to commit to driving it and seeing it through as an organization? Yeah, that, that's what I said, over the next five years. So we are starting every year. We'll look at what we've done for the first year. Starting now. So like it's Herculean, but I have to be talking to every local government chairman in the country. And one of the things, who, the way we also want to domicile is or domiscate is that local governments, if you look at the structure, sometimes they do have supervisory councillors, agriculture, 
uh, education, health. And then I will say, yeah, let's keep the eye on the ball and say, maybe the commissioner of uh, the supervising council of education now is not only going to be education, but education and entrepreneurship. We also want to anchor it in entrepreneurship, which will include how far we'll ask you after this year, what has the local government do, done with regards to having one industry that will be able to make use of uh, the material in that local government that is competitive in the market. Thank you very much, Emeka. That's a very also refreshing and uh, challenging and enterprising and interesting thought. I pray, I honestly pray that you are able to drive this through. You don't get frustrated and you don't uh, get uh, discouraged and uh, you have the resource because honestly, you are going to need a bit of resource even to do the logistics and the moving around and the pulling together and getting people on the same table uh, uh, to do this. But I think if this can be done, I think it will be earth breaking for Nigeria. Uh, Ayo, what do you think about this? And what are your other thoughts on diversifying the Nigerian economy? Ayo, please unmute. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You can, yeah. I say I speak with people like Emeka on a daily basis, and they come with all these wonderful ideas. And it play. I, I sometimes marvel how come the people with all the ideas are outside government. The people in government are the people with no ideas. I've <laughs> never, really, <laughs> I've never been able to get my head around that. You know, if you could put together a national eco economic uh, panel whereby you have people like Emeka to drive through these ideas, it would make a huge difference in Nigeria. The last time we got that right was under General Yakubu Gowa. He put together a National Economic Council. He had Aulawa as his vice chairman. He had people like Joseph Taka, Aminu Kano, Anthony Enahuru. He got the best brains in Nigeria. He made them a National Economic Council. He was the chairman. They came up with all the ideas. And what did he do? He would just take the ideas to the Supreme Military Council, they would rubber stamp it, and it became policy. You know, and that is how we had all that. If you look back, that was when we had the most infrastructure, the most infra, the, the, the most comprehensive infrastructure development in Nigeria. Be a Papa Port, Lagos Ibadan Expressway, Lagos Badagra Expressway, First Tax 77 was agreed, National Theatre was built. Uh, you know, they did National a lot of stadium. National Stadium. Tinkan Island, you Volkswagen, Peugeot, Peugeot to Kaduna. And I'm go. Uh, we can go on and on. They did a lot of things. And I, I just, if you look back, probably not one of those ideas was General Gowan's idea. But you know what? They worked because he had people like Emeka around him who were putting forward these ideas. So, yeah, this is somebody, this is a thinking man here, you know, but unfortunately, He's drowned out. I mean, I've been listening to some of the statements I've seen over the last week, and I just showed that some of the governors, some of their pronouncements. I don't know if any of you heard Governor Finitri in Adamawa State, what he said yesterday, that anybody caught looting, if, that he's going to crack down on them. If you take a bag of gari or rice from any warehouse to a house, they're going to, first of all, remove the CFO, CFO then they're going to demolish that house. You are going to demolish a building over a bag of Gary. And I'm like, come, are you for real? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I heard a statement from Femi Adesina today. Say, oh, those people who are looting where well, you know what, they are not hungry. Oh, there's nothing wrong with them. And I'm like, come, what's going on here, man? So I don't know, I don't know. They just sometimes you think about it and it exasperates you so much. You think, you know what, I don't want to be bothered. <laughs> but uh, we have to keep faith. We have to keep faith. You have to be bothered, though. <laughs> you have to be bothered. We all have to be bothered, you know, and that is really the challenge, you know, because part of what people like Emeka uh, and all sorts of people uh, have challenges with, I mean, you have a whole Nigerian Economic Summit group that meets every year. You know, after a while, I stopped going for those meetings because they will meet everywhere. Yeah, you have at Edopita side, Aswe Godalo, Shola David Bora, Pascal Dozier. Chief Oshonekon, all the really good brains of Nigeria. 
uh, Christopher Kolade, and so on and so forth. Uh, my good friend, the former MD of Kadri, uh, and, and, and Bumioni, they were all there driving thoughts, driving policy, coming up with ideas, bringing all sorts of speakers from all over the world, this and that. And they will come up with templates and nothing, absolutely zero would happen. Nothing would happen. We'll have three days of pressure, running around, writing reports, presentation. A president will come, whoever the president was, national anthem. He will listen, make some remarks, and go away. And next year, we're back. Again, PWC, KPMG, all of them doing things. You know, um, why is it that our leaders, those who are in responsibility, have not really been able to push through, you know, a lot of these ideas that we have. You know, there was somebody that came from a Southeast, uh, Eastern African country, maybe Burundi or Rwanda or somewhere like that. And they asked him to talk because the economy there was doing so well. I think it was Burundi at that time. And he looked at us and said, why have you people invited me here to tell you about how our economy is thriving? He says it was Professor Ojetunji Aboyade that wrote our economic blueprint, a professor from Nigeria. He wrote our economic blueprint. And the man, I think he had, he's passed on now, but probably was still alive or had just passed on there. So why don't you go and look for him? He did it for us. Why doesn't he do it for you? Those were his opening remarks. And this is the challenge we have in Nigeria. A lot of brilliant minds, like you said, 20% uh, of your borough, you said, is, is Nigerian. If you took Nigerians out of the uh, UK health industry, for instance, you know what will happen to that industry. It will happen the same thing in Houston, the same thing in Washington, D.C., the same thing in probably Dallas or Texas and all sorts of places like that. You know, the, the, the mayor of Houston the other day was celebrating Nigerians and thanking them for, for, for adding so much value to his economy. Even in Canada now, uh, a Nigerian is like the uh, attorney general of one of the states or something like that. It's unbelievable. Um, so what, 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 what do we do, Ayo? How do we get our leaders, our civil service, our public service to please try and work out these ideas and work on these ideas and make these ideas work? Or what do we need to do? Well, first of all, I think we need laws that compel the government to react to certain scenarios. Like for instance, in the UK, there's a law that compels the House of Commons to debate an issue once you have 100,000 signatures to a petition. And that is why the House of Commons is going to debate the NSAS issue sometime next week, I believe, because we've got something like 300,000 signatures. So we probably need one senator to forward a bill that compels the government to, you know, it sets th certain thresholds. And after that, and once those thresholds are met, the government should be compelled to debate the issue. And I fully agree with you on this issue of having so many ideas. And to be honest, we don't need to reinvent the world. I was speaking with one of my classmates a few years ago. He went to the NIE. PSS in just in, Kuru, in Kuru, near just. He's a doctor and um, he deals with dermatology, skin is his major issue. So what he does, he comes to the UK, he buys um, good equipment, he buys good medicine and he takes it back to the Nigeria and he treats rare skin diseases. And he told me that when, after he did his year at the NIP, NIPSS, you then have to go and file it in the library. So he typed all his documents together. I have, I contributed as best as I could. I helped him. He went to file in the lab. He said he was shocked to find out that when he got there, there were about 10 similar projects that had been filed. And he said that was across the board. Accountancy, security, manufacturing, tourism, healthcare, education. He said it was the same thing. Across the board, people had filed all these ideas. So my point is, we need a law that compels the government to go and look into these archives and dig out some of these ideas. Nobody's doing that. All these reports are gathering dust. 
So, I mean, in a nutshell, we're not, there's nothing in the Nigerian constitution or in Nigerian law that compels the government to act once public feeling is, you know, reaches a certain point. So I think we need laws. We need to use our influence to get certain senators to pass laws to say, you know what, under certain circumstances, the government is compelled to act. Very good. Now let's look quickly at the issue of NSAS since you all are marching in London very soon on this NSAS. What are your thoughts on NSAS and what do you think uh, should be the follow on on this uh, particular aspect of our, of our life right now? Well, as things stand, we keep on hearing conflicting reports from the government. The Nigerian army first of all said it wasn't there then they said they were there, but they were with blanks. Now they are trying to say it was Fashola who ordered the shooting. Fashola? Uh, yeah, um, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Sawul. <laughs> sorry, Governor <laughs> Sawul. <laughs> so we keep on hearing also, can they, Nigeria, I mean, can they just hold their hands up? Okay, we got it wrong. We made a mistake. And let's get over it. Um, but for me, it's not just about SARS, though. It's about... Our youths are frustrated and angry, no opportunities, no future for them. They're taken to the streets. I hope our elite take this as a message. It's a turning point. It can no longer be business as usual. I think we first of all need to concede that. Secondly, you, go, you look at the issue of all these shadowy figures around the government who you know, want to crack down on protesters whenever there's any uprising, whenever there's any protest in the country. I mean, in a few weeks up to the protest, I said they were going to crack down. I wrote about this on my platform. Because in a few, for a few weeks, for about a week up to the protest, we started hearing people talk about um, necessary process, we shouldn't follow due process. Oh, these people are miscreants. Clearly, they were feeling uncomfortable. I think a lot of people around government haven't got around to the fact that we are now a democracy. And there are certain standards of behavior that you just have to adhere to. You know, we once produced a, a document called um, Vision 2020, where Nigeria aspired to be among the top 20 countries in the world. And that obviously came with a lot of domestic and uh, democratic responsibilities. So as a people, I think we have to learn to accept that end south is going to be a reality of Nigeria going forward. And if you ask me, to be honest, Pastor, I can see the youth being back next year. I can see them being back in 2022. Because the problems are there for all to see. Crude oil prices have dropped to forty dollars a barrel, right? From they used to be a hundred dollars or so, but they dropped to forty price. Nobody, very few countries are buying crude oil anymore. We have not diversified. We're not selling other products, so Nigeria's revenue is decreasing, which means there's less money to spend on amenities, healthcare, social services, infrastructure less jobs have been created you know a few companies have even said they're pulling out of nigeria because you know the economic conditions have changed so the way i look at it next year our youth are going to be angrier what is the government going to do to address this issue they can't keep shooting them i mean if anything the nigerian security forces will run out of ammunition anyway because we don't even produce enough ammunition to start with so what is the government going to do? I don't think they've got a solution. I haven't seen anything so far to suggest that, you know, we've got a solution. When the youth come back next year, this and this and this will be what we'll be able to say to them, look, this is what we're doing, this is what we've done, and we can guarantee you things will be better going forward. So um, uh, I do, I, uh, I dread what is going to happen, but um, fingers crossed, I'm just hoping Maybe some of you on this platform with your great ideas, people like Emeka can get your message across to the government and let them and get them to say, you know what, let's sit down and brainstorm and come up with practical solutions. Thank you very much, Ayo. A gentleman, a lady called Joyce Banda uh, had this to say. We have diverse, we have decided to diversify agriculture. We decided to develop our tourism sector. We have said develop our mining sector. So these are some of the things we're telling Malawians. We say, this is what we need to do. 
in order for us to get out of this total dependence on aid. Joyce Banda, I think she was the Prime Minister of Malawi at a certain time. Also, a gentleman called Shai Agassi had this to say. I started digging and I found that Israel signed a peace treaty with the United Arab Emirates after that country had diversified their economy instead of being solely oil-based. I, I found that Israel signed a treaty. This diversification has brought about modernization. I realized that if you land the price of oil, countries will diversify their economies and as a result, modernize. I pray that the fall in the price of oil will force us to modernize. But you see, Nigerians still keep hanging on to this oil as though uh, uh, oil is going to still be the magic wand. When people are shouting drums of gas, drums of electric, electric cars, and so on and so forth. I have a brother on the platform, uh, and I'm going to surprise him. Mr. Francis Odubeku, I think he's an international economist, and he's been on a tour, uh, career tour, of, of different economies across Africa, working as an expatriate. I'd like Francis to please make a few comments on this issue of diversifying Nigeria's economy. And if indeed there are any other thoughts on the platform, it'd be a nice time to hear these thoughts and then we'll take it from there. Francis? Thank you, Pastor Itra. And yes, diversification is key. I think um, that is what Nigeria has the opportunity to return to. And that is what a lot of countries are being encouraged to do. What is the alternative? In a lot of other African countries, the alternative, unfortunately, is subsistence farming, when they are just relying on rainfall patterns you know, at the complete mercy of the elements. The, what other countries have been advised, such as Nigeria, is to diversify into a service economy. That way you can generate employment and at the same time you have more control over what happens. Interesting, well, uh, not just interesting, but it is the case that this is also youth dependent. That is also where countries of Africa and Nigeria in particular have an advantage because of their demographics. A majority of Africans are youthful. So compared to even in the more industrialized countries where their populations are aging. So at the end of the day, or at the end of the century, whichever you might have it, Ultimately, they'll have to come to where the lever is to drive whatever it is, whatever. So there are advantages all around. And in order to reap those advantages, we must diversify. So diversify, diversification is the name of the game. Thank you very much, Francis. Thank you for those thoughts. And uh, we're going to note them that uh, diversification is absolutely necessary and it's in the name of the game. I'm going to shock somebody else and ask him to make a comment, uh, an old politician, the son of an old politician. His father used to be a minister in the world. Please unmute yourself and let's hear from you. Am I assuming that you're talking to me, uh, Pastor? Definitely you, <laughs> Dex. <laughs> I caught you there. <laughs> Absolutely. My name is Akitayo Akindeko. Uh, I, I, am, I am obviously a very close member of uh, the Godalo family. I've been watching all these programs as, as often as I can, as quietly as I can, hoping I don't get drawn into anything too controversial. The thing is, the Yen size children have made it very clear to us that uh, we old folks should sit back now and let the youngsters take over. So we are doing that bit by bit. But really, I mean, I've so enjoyed listening to all the programs, especially this one today. But what I think the speaker failed to emphasize is that the risk element 
in, in development, in private, it's private, in, uh, private capital that is driving investments now. And private capital will only go to where the region is secure, where there's security. It will only go to where there's little corruption. And those two things are killing the initiative for any investment in Nigeria. Uh, I've done it all, been to most of these things over the years that I've been working in Nigeria. Uh, I'm back in, in the farming sector now. And this road problem is something that's killing all of us. But the real thing is that bringing private money to industrialize, to get any of these things going, diversification, big business, uh, or everything, everybody wants to return on their money. Once you don't get the environment where you can safely invest, nothing is going to happen. We've got to kill corruption. We've got to kill insecurity. Without those two things, we ain't going nowhere. If you allow me to just cut my contribution to that at this point, it, it will I'll appreciate it. No problem, my dear brother. Thank you very much. And I think you brought on two very, very important pieces. Security, 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 um, oil field blombing and all that, ham robbers, Boko Haram, and all manners of, even now, uh, the various raids on the various uh, supermarkets, everything. And then, of course, corruption, corruption. Ayo, can I have your thoughts? on corruption and how do we kill corruption in Nigeria? Uh, it's become almost endemic. And uh, what I've discovered uh, with all due respects is that it's not just the politicians that are corrupt, the civil service is corrupt and even the private sector is very, very corrupt. And guess what? The churches are corrupt too. There's corruption. <laughs> Everywhere you have a church who fiddles the books, who <laughs> we can't hear. Can't hear you anymore, Pastor. Pastor, I think you've frozen. Some people are saying you've frozen. They can't hear you. Yeah. I mean, I can hear you. I don't think anybody else can. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I mean, yes, this issue of corruption, Pastor, you made the point. You know, in Nigeria, politics is an entrepreneurial business. You go into politics to make money, you know. The, my one consolation from all this is I look at Brazil and Mexico. They used to have the same problem some 20, 30 years ago, but they managed to get around it. So I think we can. Now, because the bony hand of hunger devastates our community, uh, you know, and affects so many people, it's no surprise that everybody, everybody is involved. You know, I look at where we are as a nation today. The minimum wage is 30,000 Naira a month. A 50 kg bag of rice costs 48,000 Naira a month. Now, how will a man not be corrupt? How do you feed it? I mean, this is just food. Oh. I haven't spoken about transport and rent and healthcare and education. 
How won't a man be corrupt? So the first thing we have to do is we have to increase salaries. Our minimum wage, the minimum wage in South Africa, you know, is something, you know, is, is equivalent to about $980 a month, you know, which is probably, you know, about five to six times the Nigeria minimum wage. That is something we need to address, first of all. You know, you can't pay people 30,000 naira a month and expect them not to take bribes. It's simply unrealistic. You know, it barely meets their survival costs. And, and, you know, and the UN is clear about this. Anything less than $2 a day is extreme poverty, one. You know, you know um, as, as a whole, as a people, Secondly, what we need to do, we need a reorientation of our mindset because as Nigeria stands today, who you are or how well respected you are is based on how much money you've got in your pocket. Now, growing up as a kid, that wasn't the Nigeria which I knew. A lot of the intellectuals of the first republic, you know, till today, Tafawa Balewa never built any house. You understand? We, we didn't know people like that for how much money they had. We respected them for their thoughts and their ideas and what they brought to the table. Today, it's all about money. So as a people, we have to address that. And this is where our National Orientation Agency is letting us down woefully. Woof. I mean, does it even exist? When is the last time the NOA actually, the National Orientation Agency actually embarked on a campaign? You know, we need to emphasize the point that money is not everything. It's just one thing, but to use it as a benchmark, you know, I mean, Pastor, you made the point. People steal money and bring it to the church, you know, and, you know, they are given front row seats. Well, in fact, special pews are manufactured for them. Ordinary members of the church are not allowed to sit in those seats. And, you know, we give criminal chieftaincy titles in various communities. People hand their daughters to a criminal to say, you know what? Here, I'm giving you my daughter as a wife. And I'm like, hey, excuse me, this man is a criminal. He's a rogue. He should be ostracized. And to be honest, I, I nearly gave up after I saw when James Ibori returned to Nigeria. I saw the crowds that turned out to welcome him. And I just thought to myself, ah, uh, this is a man who stole your money. He used it to buy property in the UK. He's now coming back after being punished and you are welcoming him. And you know, I thought, you know, it is you ser it serves you right. You know what? Yes, the next governor, he will look at this and think, you know what, I can also steal your money and get away with it. So yes, we need to reorientate ourselves as a people and get this money thing off our minds. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and there's a lot of work to do, but it seems as though we're not, the tone at the top is not really dealing with these issues. And quite frankly, that was one of the things we were expecting from General Buhari when he came in based on his antecedents with Tunde Idiagbo about 40 years ago. But somehow, we don't seem to have hit that tone again, even with this present administration. Uh, the man himself, they say, is clean, squeaky clean. But they say those that surround him here, there, everywhere, it's almost business as usual. So I pray that we can really uh, get this tone right at the top and um, count the cost, count the cost of what we're going through. Mr. Femi Wokwetu, I hear you'd like to say a few words. Let me ask you to join, please. Please unmute yourself. Thank you very much. If I go back memory lane, as far back as when I was in secondary school, diversifying Nigerian economy has always been a topic and we have never achieved it. Which shows also to me that um, people of my age, 50 and above, we have been too taught towards our thoughts and our thinking because we also we don't have much time left for us. If you are 50 and above, you are about retiring. So that's why, and most of our leaders, who are, most of them are 50 and above, all they want to do is make money. And because of the rental economy that we have, so they are not really thinking about diversifying the economy at all. 
the, the, the uh, one of the speakers mentioned corruption. Look at China. A lot of Chinese are here. They're doing a lot in terms of corrupt, corrup corrupting our people. In China, then in China as a country, they dare not do such a thing. If they do it, they know it's it's a capital punishment. It's it's death. So why don't we adopt such a thing? You see, because the situation in which we we are, it needs a drastic solution, and and a, and a drastic problem needs a drastic solution. So if we adopt that, most people oh, will sit up. Let's be honest with ourselves. Also, I I, I heard about this. Uh, People 50 and above, let's forget them. Let's the NSAS, that means from 20 to about uh, 45 to 50. Uh, Pastor Itwa, can you organize a web seminar and bring two, two leaders from some, from, from some of these states? Bring their thoughts together. You understand me? Because it looks as if they don't really have a, a, a platform to talk. If you can organize them also, let them come up with their what maybe an agenda. Because let me be honest with you, the, the NSAS is not only about killing of policemen. It is about corruption. It is about uh, our legislators. Because let's be honest with you, all of them without you cannot you, you can just classify all, almost all of them as politicians only out there to make money but if we can do something i some of us like you bring their voice together cultivate them to be something so that they, they can come up with something like a national conference of youths and say this is how we want our country governed because 50 and above people are on their way out. 20 to, to, to about 45 are the people who will still rule this country. So please, if you can put something together, answer, so I don't know what's, what topic you're gonna to give it to it. I think it will go a long way to help us articulate the ideas of these youths all over the country. And I share the view of, um, the, the main speaker who said, if your country is thriving, nothing stops Bene, nothing stops other, 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 other countries to say, let's join hands together. But there must be, that means this country must have its rules, justice must prevail, and what else? And, and the rule of law. So it's upon that, that we can say, yes, we can truly diversify. Every other thing, every speaker has been saying, yes, do this, do this. If we don't take it from the roots, this also will just be an endless talk, another seminar, and we'll just go away. Five years down the line again, we'll come back to say diversification. Thank you so much. What do you mean by taking it from the roots? I didn't quite get that. When I say taking it from the roots, you know, the young people, the young guys now, I'm over 50. The people who actually did the answers is not only police brutality. It's not the police brutality is just one. It's just a minute one of what they want. So if we can organize this answers people, either do, do, do something in the papers and say, okay, from each state, if you are part of the answers, can you come up with who you should be, who should be your leaders, either per state or per local government, and then put them together somewhere. Although it's neat, it needs logistics, it needs finance, put them together, maybe in a platform, in a web seminar, even if they can't meet together, if they can't meet physically, maybe via web seminar, they can put all their thoughts together, somebody organizes it and then their thoughts are put together as, and, and it's sent to the authorities. Then the authorities will know that the youths of this country are not joking. They mean business. Thank you. Okay, that's very good. Mean. We'll see, we'll see, we can attempt that. Uh, I'll see, I'll, I'll give it a lot of thought.
and see if doable. I'm sure that uh, Mr. Elijah Adio, you may have one or two comments to add, and then I'm going to take Mrs. Ronke Fetuga, and then I'll take closing remarks from 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 our guest speaker. So, Elijah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Petua. We appreciate you very much for uh, getting this together. And I would like to thank also the main speaker. And uh, I wish um, the rulers of Nigeria is full of wisdom and thoughts. And every speaker likewise, a maker the same. Uh, my, I feel that in Nigeria, the survival of Nigeria is indeed the youth, as we have all agreed. But as of now, Nigeria is ungovernable because we have people that have they're, they're clueless when it comes to ideas. All they in there for is money. We see a lot of them sleeping during session. There was even a time when somebody said, "Oh, now that I'm elected into office, what am I what am I going to be doing there?" Now you have to think about. It. Okay, so. And I think the biggest problem in Nigeria right now, along with what the speakers have, have said already, is this. There is a, a certain part of Nigeria who think all they have is just to rule. All these ideas we're putting together, I've been among these people, they don't care. All they care about is today's food. That's it. So, and this, if, if people like this are ruling you, these are uneducated people ruling the educated people. Okay? You have idealist people ruling people that have all the ideas. So they don't care. Therefore, all they care is money. Look at my, look at, look at my yacht. Oh, look at my house. Imagine, you know, IG of the country. I don't know what they call it, it's IG, whatever, but I don't live in Nigeria right now, but look, building all these fantastic things in mean, KP or, or Kano and all that, okay? Used to be a lawyer, a, you know, a junior lawyer too. So, and then you have a people now putting people into power just because of where they come from. Just be, not because of their ideas, but just to say that, yes, we are infiltrating every aspect of power. So if there's a way, I'm hoping that the solutions that the former speakers have talked about will help. But sir, I will really, really want us to okay, grow on education, education, education. Because all the people that are giving guns to just go shoot, to go do all these bandits and all that, they don't, they don't, they don't know anything. Okay, when I, when I came to America 40 years ago, I didn't know a whole lot, but I already graduated, did NYC Nigeria in 1978. Okay, so the part of the country that I grew up in did not expose me to anything other than just, you know, this screw or that screw. Everything was paid for by government. So the constitution of Nigeria is the, is the major problem. That constitution has to change. If it doesn't change, everything else will just be falling off. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Fetuga, can I have quick comments from you before we close? And I'll just take a very quick comment from Charles Iore also. Mrs. Fetuga, please. I believe, I hope you can hear me. Yes. I believe, I, I saw, I've always said anytime I have an opportunity to talk on this forum, that we are speaking to the converted. We should get more younger people. We should invite younger people to come and listen to some of what we are saying. The guest speaker spoke very, very well about our not relying on oil. Apart from that, we have education, we have manpower. The manpower, how do we really, really go about making sure that we have the right 
the right person in the right place. Quickly, the situation now in the Cross River State, where there has been an acting chief judge in Cross River State, which has been refused to be sworn in because she's from Akwa Ibom. In year 2020, what can anybody do about that? I'm talking as a woman. It's a woman from Akwa, from Akwa Ibom who has lived all her life in Cross River State but has not been sworn in. So we have all kinds of issues. The constitution right, we have a new constitution. How do we make it work? How do we make it work on a practical point? We have to be practical. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ma. Thank you for those very kind thoughts and words, how to make constitution relevant and practical and how to even diversify the brain of the Nigerian so that we can yeah. think more as Nigerians unless as aqua ibomites or, or cross rivarians uh charles very very quickly please we're about to close okay uh, i must say a great thank you to Aya i think his presentation was brilliant in terms of creating industrial notes i put it out in the system when people steal billions can you still call that corruption because i don't think one person can just carry it. don't take it in your with your hands so there's a major systemic failure. And until you deal with the reason why there's a systemic failure, it's gonna be difficult for you to do anything. Is there any local government that has demonstrated statecraft or state government that has demonstrated statecraft? Those are the questions we need to deal with. And um, the way I can fair put it, I can see his passion. But unfortunately, if you go to a river with a basket, you are likely to come back with water to your house. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, Timmy Tokwe, you're on the platform also. I see you waving, lifting up your hands to ask a quick question or to make a quick comment. Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, it's been a, a really insightful discussion about corruption and I appreciate a lot of the thoughts that have come through, especially the um, ones about where do we start when we don't have security or there's corruption. And I would beg to differ from the speaker that spoke a lot about the answers. I do agree the answers movement. I think it has restored a lot of hope in the populace. It has restored faith in what the Nigerian population is capable of doing. But I think there's a lot more insight required. There's a need for the young generation to be aware of their history so that they can make better use of. Um, I, I would just say I would support ageism just, just because somebody is a particular age, they cannot rule because I don't think age is a determinant of wisdom or of zeal or of strength. But I think it should be appreciated across board that the youths bring their zeal and strength to the table and the older ones bring their wisdom and history to the table. And then we need to marry both of them to move forward. But there's definitely a lot of work to be done. I think the media needs to play a few. Some people only listen to the radio. I think there are things that need to be pushed forward to become a bit more pervasive in our society so that we can begin to gradually build and change the mindset of people because it requires a whole change of mindset from the bottom up at every level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I am going to come back to you with your closing thoughts. I want to thank everybody on the platform today. I am not going to mention any names except one, Regina. I see you. And uh, next time I'm going to ask you to talk, so be ready. Um, so uh, <laughs> finally, China says China will stay firmly committed to the basic state policy of opening up. We will actively and effectively use foreign investment, improve infrastructure, diversify its form, and open more channels and sectors so as to facilitate investment. That's a country with all the industrialization still wanting to diversify and uh, open up its economy so that it can harness the full potential. So what is Nigeria doing? 
Ayo, I want your closing thoughts on two issues. Number one, what process should Nigeria go through to getting the right kind of leadership? So what process and how do we do it? And then number two, if you are president of Nigeria, what would you do? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you very much for that, Pastor. First of all, I, I think I'll take the second question first. To be honest, if I was president of Nigeria, what I would do, I would just shut off the oil taps, right? I would stop paying up federal allocation to force the pace of development. It is this crude oil that is spoiling us and that is making us intellectually lazy. If there is no free handouts, people will be forced to generate revenue, right? Now, on the, on the, on the issue of um, the process, it's crystal clear to me. The crude oil economy is a global thing. Nigeria has no control over it. It's a very volatile economy. So tomorrow, prices can drop to $10 a barrel, and it can ruin your economy, even if you have got the best managers in the world. So that is a matter that has to be addressed. I think Femi Adeshina once said that Nigeria has an annual infrastructural deficit of $100 billion. $100 billion a year is what we need to invest in our infrastructure. Meanwhile, our budget is only $30 billion. So no matter how you look at it, with the greatest will in the world, we simply do not have the cash to meet our challenges. So what I would say is, in answer to your question about the process of leadership, I think we the electorate, to be honest, are the biggest corporates here. When people run for governor, they run for senator, we don't put any questions to them. The first question we should put to anybody wanting to lead us is, hey, you know what? How can you double the economy of our state? If you can't answer that question, it should be a no-no. You should not even get one vote if you cannot tell us how it's going to double our GDP. Because I look at Nigeria as it stands. How much are we getting? The diaspora sends in $25 billion a year in, um, in remittances. If we were getting half of that in foreign investment, it probably would help. But we're not. It's how many state governors are going around the world looking for foreign direct investment? Very few of them. You know, and I once wrote after a Doha conference saying, you know what? What Nigeria needs to do is be leading other African countries to give the industrialized world quotas to say, you know what? This is our investment quota. We need $10 billion of foreign direct investment invested in our economy if you want to get out of this rut. We're not doing it. So to round up, I would just say, as an electorate, we need this, there's some serious issues we need to be putting to our aspirants at election time, which we are not doing. We're just taking their stomach infrastructure and voting for them. And then when they mess up, we complain. No, it's our fault. We need to drop a list, and maybe this is something this forum should take away now. In the run-up to 2023, let's draw up a list of questions which we are going to put to every gubernatorial and senatorial aspirant and say, you know what? If you can't answer these questions, you don't get our vote. Thank you very much, Ayo. I want to really yeah. thank you for being on this platform today. It's been very revealing for me, your thoughts and your thinking, the various things that you think each uh, state can produce to make us a diversified economy, the return back to 1958 and the reducing of the present exclusive list and the uh, annexure or the possibilities of wielding together even a bigger state by inviting people to be part of this place and therefore being a much larger economy. I think those are really fresh thoughts. I want to thank Emeka for his thoughts on investing in each local government area and making that local government area very strong. Two million dollars should be able to do a few things in each local government area. Akita Akideko spoke about security and the issue of corruption, and we've dwelt therein. And I like the fact that uh, your own approach to corruption was not carry everybody, jail them, put them there for 84 years, and so on and so forth. But first of all, let us kind of create an environment that discourages corruption 
by better reward for labor. And then you can begin to wield the stick. So let's deal with the carrot and then wield uh, the stick. Uh, the only thing that maybe you didn't quite think of is that a lot of people even in employment today, even in government, are underemployed. They hardly do anything. They're not very productive. So we have a bloated civil service of people who do very little in terms of productivity. And therefore, maybe that civil service is your own welfare uh, cushion in Nigeria. But nonetheless, I think it's a very, very good idea uh, to pay people well. Then you can start to demand from them uh, performance and uh, righteousness, as it were. Anyway, I want to thank everybody for all their comments today. Very, very fresh, very revealing. We're going to put these thoughts together and we're going to begin to see how we can bring them before government and see what government will be able to do. And then the gentleman that spoke about having some kind of platform for the young people where they can express themselves. We'll see if that idea is doable. They say they don't have any leaders. Maybe we'll be able to dig up one or two people and uh, put them on the platform and see if we can have a discourse. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much. Nigeria will be great again. Nigeria will be mighty. Nigeria will not fail. God will look over this nation. God will breathe over this nation, produce the right kind of leaders for us and make us the right kind of followers in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your public holiday and Thank have a nice you. weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, I guess. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much, Pastor. Thank you, Mr. Akifa. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Thank you. 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 God bless you all. See you next Thursday. And like somebody said, let's try and invite the young people. If you have children, please bring them on the platform. Let's on the platform so that we can have richer discussions. Please, everybody should try and invite at least two or three people next week. Please, let's yeah. try and do that. Two or three people next week so that we can grow the base and have more people on the platform. Thank you very, very much. I'm grateful. Okay, Pastor. Thank oh, you. We'll, Thank we'll you. do just that. Invite, people. Invite at least two, three more people next yeah. week. Thank Pastor, you. Pastor, what's the topic? The topic next week. Oh, my Thank goodness. You, Pastor. I'll try and send it forward during the week. But it's going to be something interesting, definitely. Okay. Yes. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Invite this people next week. Thank I wanna, you. I want to thank you for the speaker. I'd yeah. like to, I'm, I'm in the US, he's in the UK. I'd like yeah. to get some information about this guy. I'd like to talk to him. I mean, okay. these are the kind of people that have so much, he has so much to give, yeah. you know. And um, why, why, see, Nigeria is very rich. I, I say one thing all the time that Nigerians. Leslie, are where you get Bia Bia from? <laughs> Go ahead, Be -a -be -a Leslie. We'll give you that. Anyway, go ahead. Say what in here that Nigerians very successful people, but we'll discuss later. Uh, this is a COVID Be -a -be -a. You mean look like a Nigerian? Like 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 COVID Be a Be a too too. A COVID Be a Be a. Sorry, Elijah. I'm sorry. I was just seeing my guy with the white, sorry, white Elijah, whiskers sorry, all over the place. I was just guy with the white, white whiskers all over the place. So, and what, I'm, I just want to thank you for this forum that you've been for. And uh, part of, you know, of course, I, uh, we are that uh, people up north will also try and learn from this mentality of they want to rule. And then that's a big, major problem because people don't care about Tomorrow, they can only do about today. That's how I used to be because I grew up there. So, God bless you, Pastor. Thank you very much. God bless you. I'm very grateful. So, I'll Thank see you. how I can hook you up with Ayu Akinfe. I will give you his details, and I'm sure he'll be happy to connect with you. Yes, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Leslie, God bless you. This be a very frightening person. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sh Thank everything you. is okay now. You are strong. Eh? 
I am, thank God. I'm very right. strong now. Excellent. Just moving small, small. Small, small. small. Okay. Thank you. All right, bro. Bless you. Greet mommy then for me. All right. And I will do. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, man. One okay. more thing, Elijah speaking. One yes. more thing. Um, Mrs. Mambula, Dr. Mambula okay. is yeah. here now in the US. Okay, okay, where is she? Oh, she's she's here not um, and the place called um, all um, she's in Oklahoma City area. Okay, we'll try and get her. We'll look for me for me. We'll try and get her and okay. uh, put her on the platform as soon as possible. Yes, yeah, now. So I think I will find out how long she can stay here, but um, she's there with the husband for now. Okay, all right, not a problem. Thank you. Okay, bro.